Questions? Governor, President-elect Biden has said that Trump administration, uh, its plans to distribute the vaccines have fallen behind by now. There should have been 20 million, there's only been a few million. How has Massachusetts been impacted by this? How behind is Massachusetts? And do you think the current administration has dropped the ball on this rollout? Well, first of all, this is the largest rollout of a vaccination program in U.S. history. And, um, and it can't happen fast enough. Um, that said, we were expecting to get about 300,000 doses by the end of the calendar year, and we're going to get about 300,000 doses by the end of the calendar year. Um, I said when this whole thing was first being discussed about three or four weeks ago that I expected the rollout would be bumpy. And um, it certainly lived up to my expectations with respect to that. Um, but I've also talked to um, folks in the pharma business, both on the Moderna side and the Pfizer side, who have said to me that they believe they will be able to deliver on their production schedules and their production requirements. Um, the, uh, so I would then expect that at some point we're going to get to the point in the next a uh, few weeks, maybe a month, I'm not sure how long it will take, where that flywheel will really start to spin. And, uh, and then our big challenge is going to be making sure that we have the capacity uh, in the places and spaces we need it in, in Massachusetts, to actually deliver the last mile, which is the actual shot in the arm, twice to the people who um, are eligible for the vaccine. I think, I think so, yeah. Governor, 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 is, there, is, is there any um, talk or discussion in the future of doing some sort of mass distribution of the vaccine? I mean, obviously, we're all going to be talking to our doctors and stuff, but maybe using the test, uh, the testing structure, trying to do it like, you know, um, in the parking lot to try to get more, reach more people. There are a lot of conversations going on about, you know, as, the, as you get away from what I would describe as the targeted audiences, to sort of the more general um, distrib distribution of vaccine, the, the notion about what the proper and most appropriate way to do it um, on a grand scale is something we've been talking about. But one of the things I would point out is um, there are currently, um, there, there is currently an infrastructure around vaccine distribution that involves pharmacies, outpatient clinics, hospitals, doctor's offices, um, community health centers. I mean, there are a lot of players who already operate in the vaccine administration space in Massachusetts, all of whom, by the way, are connected to um, the various public health um, apparatus that's required for purposes of reporting all this stuff. But um, we certainly think once you get out of some of the targeted audiences and get into a more diffuse distribution, um, we're going to have to be back here talking to you all about how that would work. I can tell you that I think isn't the command center meeting with those folks tomorrow? Okay, yeah. So um, we, we're in contact uh, and in conversation with those folks already, but there's a formal meeting tomorrow to talk about, in particular, the first responder stuff. Well, the firefighters union has criticized what they say is kind of a lack of urgency here with the plan. Why don't they have a date yet? Why don't they know the plan yet? What's the delay? There are two big issues associated with how this happens. The first one, which we've just been talking about, is the actual allocation of the vaccines so that we know when we're actually going to be able to make them available to people. We need to know the answer to that question, right? That's like number one. The second is the conversation that they're going to have um, tomorrow, which is what would be the most appropriate way to deal with the fact that when you're dealing with 351 communities, which vary tremendously with respect to both the size and scale and structure 
of their first responder operations. Remember, in Massachusetts, you have volunteer firefighters, fire departments. You have some places that use uh, 911 that is operational at the local level. Some people use a third party to do their 911 work. Um, some folks have shared departments. I mean, there's a lot of issues there that need to get processed to make sure that um, th this is a great example of where a one-size-fits-all is not the right answer, and we need to make sure that we do something that we believe can work administratively and from a reporting point of view, but will also work for the fact that we have a lot of different ways of organizing and structuring how first responders operate and are administered, their programs are administered in Massachusetts. So are you, are you saying it should be no, I'm saying just the opposite, that I think we need to figure out what the right approach to this is and how much of this could be done by the locals, how much um, ought to be done with the support of the Commonwealth, and then what are going to be the sites, generally speaking, that people will be able to access um, as this process rolls out. Uh, I think the Lieutenant Governor and I made pretty clear that uh, from the beginning that we believe that um, while we work a lot, we are not, from our point of view, um, worthy of cutting the line. Um, I, I don't understand why a lot of the people who cut the line cut it. I just don't. It doesn't make any sense to me. and. Um, and I think it's inconsistent with the message that we have all tried to send on this, which is why we recognize and understand that everybody would like to be vaccinated today. Um, there are some people who are at far greater risk from a health point of view um, than others, and they really ought to be prioritized. In addition to that, um, we also said from the beginning that we wanted to make sure that we focused on our health care community because our health care community's health has a lot to do with our ability to actually serve not just people who have COVID issues, but people who have other health care issues as well. Anything we can do uh, extra on New Year's Eve going into tomorrow? I mean, obviously we've changed the protocols and messaging, but is there anything else that the state police can do? Or? Just try to, to try to minimize spread post New Year's. Do you want to speak to that? I mean, I think we've put out about as much guidance as we possibly can on this stuff. And, and I, I certainly think people, people understand what we would like to see people do, which is um, to watch the football game or a good movie um, and, uh, and to stay in their household. But if they are going to do something, do it outside. Don't do it inside. Do it with small groups. Don't stay a long time. Wear a mask. Don't share food. Don't share beverage. I mean, do the things that we've all talked about that are fundamental to keeping you safe if you're not going to be um, with the people you actually live with. Well, one of the reasons I was such a nag about the stimulus bill was, um, I mean, there are a lot of reasons I was a nag. It was going to, we were going to run out of unemployment support for people who, through no fault of their own, can't, can't go back to the job they had or find one. Um, there's also a tremendous amount of money in there to support small businesses, many of which have been damaged both by the state of the economy as well as by some of the decisions people like us have made. Um, and there was also a significant amount of resource in there for additional support for testing, tracing, and vaccine programs. And I think from our point of view, that's really important um, for the purpose of actually funding and supporting the last mile on this, the actual administration of the program um, at the point in time where you're actually giving people shots and collecting data and staying on top of them and making sure they come back and get their second vaccination. Um, in a perfect world, that all would have happened a long time ago. I'm glad it happened eventually. But it does mean that all of us um, are working against the clock on a lot of this stuff.
Well, I guess what I would say about Moderna is, um, and I would say the same thing about Pfizer and AstraZeneca if they get approved, uh, or some of the folks that are part of their supply chain. I don't want anything to happen that slows down the ability of any of these companies to manufacture vaccine and get it to people. And we had this, um, there, we had a company in Massachusetts, I don't remember which one it was, that was making, that had a role to play in manufacturing ventilators back in the spring. And they had a whole bunch of staff who were out because they had COVID, or they'd been in close contact with somebody who had COVID. And they called us up and they said, you know, we're an important part of the supply chain to make ventilators at a point in time when we had, I mean, like five ventilators at that point in time was like a gift from above. Um, no one has a ventilator shortage at this point that I know of in the U.S., but at that point in time, we were manic about our ability to access ventilators. And they called us up and they said, you know, could you guys help us with gear, PPE and gloves and all that kind of stuff? And we said, yeah. I mean, your ability to make ventilators is going to save people's lives. So my view would be, you know, if you're, if you're part of the team that's actually making vaccines, um, or providing the materials that are critical to making vaccines, I think we should all want those people to be as healthy as possible so that they can make vaccines, deliver on their production schedules, and make sure we are in a position to, to inoculate as many people as quickly as we can. Question for Secretary Sutters about nursing home distribution. Um, wondering if you're getting reports of some of the staff being hesitant. I guess one of the heads of the Benjamin Center that yeah. first said some of the homes he's heard only like 20, 30, 40 percent of the staff was willing to get the vaccine. What reports have you been given and what is the state doing to try and convince these people to get the shot? You of course, you know, we are, we want everyone to feel comfortable uh, being fully vaccinated. And as I was, I was talking about uh, Chelsea and Holyoke Soldiers Homes, um, the good news is um, CVS or Walgreens, I can't remember who did, um, but I think it was CVS did uh, the Benjamin Healthcare. Uh, they'll be coming back. And so it provides that opportunity from, you know, three week opportunity for staff to see who perhaps were reluctant to take the vaccine, the first dose, the first time to see what the response has been from both residents and other staff who were vaccinated. And hopefully, you know, staff to staff conversations we have heard are the most effective. So what they will be offered, right, uh, when CVS comes back, the opportunity to be vaccinated that time. So we have heard in some places that some staff um, decline the first time because they, they want to wait to see what the response is by either residents or staff. And so they will have another opportunity to be vaccinated. And again, that will not also be their last time to be, to have an opportunity to be vaccinated as we roll out in the general population. So, you know, we have heard that in some places. Um, like I said, up at Chelsea, CVS actually had to go back this morning to finish the staff. So many staff wanted to be vaccinated at Chelsea for the first round doses. And again, they'll be coming back on the 19th of January. And so for those staff who declined or paused or you know, didn't feel quite ready. We hope that that's an opportunity for them to see what the experience has been for other residents and staff. So we really do believe a lot of this communication, we're gonna do a lot of communication about vaccines, but really like, you know, you see what happened, you, you see the experience of a, a coworker or a colleague, we think is some of the best conversations that can happen. And on field hospitals, we've heard Lowell is delayed, delayed so, opening well, back to the staff. So um, Lowell, Lowell has sufficient staff to open a, um, the first unit of 14 on the on the 4th of January. Um, so, you know, we were talking like the end of this week, the end of this week, beginning of next week, and you don't want to open over a holiday weekend. So they're they're ready to roll on the 4th of January. Do you still need more staff for the field hospital? We, we are always recruiting for um, particularly nurses and patient care associates uh, for the Lowell Field Hospital. Um, and uh, uh, the DCU in Worcester has sufficient staff for uh, to staff 75 beds. Secretary, has yep. the state considered a free mask program? I know Everett now is giving masks out to every citizen. I don't know if that's even something the state would consider doing. So we have...
so we have provided masks to municipalities when they have asked. We did it particularly around the community enforcement and intervention teams. So when we had our field, when we had staff with boots on the ground in those communities, we always have had um, PP uh, masks, face coverings and sanitizer with us. So when municipalities have asked, we have sent out um, particularly face coverings to municipalities. I wouldn't say that we have like a, we have not done a statewide, you know, free mask for everyone. At this point, we are feeling comfortable with uh, the two field hospitals. If you remember in the springtime, we had established five um, and used two. So we, are, we have two um, that are, well, one is operational. Uh, the second one will be operational at the beginning of the week. And so, and again, you know, uh, every day, uh, I look at obviously the data with my team and have multiple phone calls a week with hospitals around, um, load, you know, patient load, uh, transfers and the like, which is why we made the statement around that we are prepared to transfer patients once stabilized in an emergency room if needed to ensure that everyone who goes into emergency room in Massachusetts gets the excellent care that they, that we expect to deliver here. So, you know, we, um, the CDC is monitoring this very, very closely and um, gives guidance to states. Um, the one thing that appears to be true about this mutant is it's um, highly, highly contagious. And so we, we just assume that, um, you know, the, as we know, we have community transmission in Massachusetts and we need everyone to engage in those good public health measures um, that we know are effective. So, thank you. Let me add a PS on that, which is that both the Pfizer and Moderna folks have said they don't believe that this variant um, would have any less uh, of an impact of their ability for their products to actually work um, against it. it. It is really the, the primary issue is not the strength of the new strain, it's the contagiousness, which obviously the, the rules of the game that we've talked about generally would apply new contagion or not. I think the um, I think at this point in time the um, there is not a uh, an appetite, lack of a better word, to uh, to change the start date for either the PFML program or the um, or, or the minimum wage increase. Keep in mind that people have been paying into the PFML program all year long, um, and therefore. Um, I think are expecting and anticipating that that benefit will be made available effective January 1. Um, on the minimum wage piece, I know there are businesses, um, given everything else that's going on, that will be stressed by that, which is part of the reason why we filed legislation and urged the legislature to act on it quickly that would take some of the sting out of the unemployment um, insurance rate issue, which um, we believe we can save literally billions of dollars um, for our employers here in the Commonwealth while protecting people's access to their unemployment benefits. Um, the, the timing on all this stuff is, um, is difficult because it comes in the, in, the, in the same cycle as the incredible pain that's been inflicted on small businesses generally. We'll have more to say, by the way, about um, about our uh, small business relief program tomorrow. Um, we said we'd be back to you guys this week about it, and we'll have, we'll have more to say about that tomorrow. But that, pretty, that program's pretty much full speed ahead, and our goal is to try to get that $668 million um, out the door and into the hands of small businesses as quickly as possible. If we don't see it tomorrow, would you want to just reflect on 2020, what a difficult year it has been? <clears throat> Well, I pounded the podium when I mentioned the fact that the year was going to be over. Um, it's hard for me to reflect on the state's history because, um, I mean, we've had 
plenty of really awful things happen. I hate to say it that way, but it's true over the course of um, the history of the Commonwealth. What I can say is that um, 2020, at least in my lifetime, is like no other year I can remember. And um, and I and I've, I've said this before, um, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself. But but if you wanted to put together a a virus that was as destructive physically, emotionally, and spiritually as it could possibly be, it would look like COVID-19. It would be asymptomatic for a lot of people so that they could spread it to others without knowing they were doing it, and at the same time convince a whole bunch of people that it's really not that bad. And at the same time, it would be an absolute murderous infection for many other people who were on the other end of this spectrum. So you wouldn't have this thing where you know, it's like the flu or the chicken pox or the measles or whatever it is, where generally speaking, if you get it, you're going to play somewhere inside a particular frame of reference. This thing is like this with respect to the way it deals with people. You literally have almost no idea if you get it what it's going to mean for you because its impact is so unpredictable. Um, in addition to that, you'd want it to be something that was so contagious that you couldn't touch anyone anymore throughout the course of the pandemic. So you can't hug anybody in the midst of a period of time when you're about as anxious as you've ever been in your life. You can't even shake somebody's hand. Um, it would completely screw up people's ability to say goodbye to loved ones, which this thing has done over and over and over again over the course of the past 10 months. Um, it would be something that would make it really hard for somebody to actually have what we would consider a normal wedding or even a normal birthday party. Um, so, I mean, from my point of view, um, 350,000 people confirmed who've had it in Massachusetts, probably a number that's significantly above that. She and I debate that all the time. Um, almost 12,000 people have passed away. Um, the impact on sort of all those businesses that literally are touch businesses. You know, the, the cafe on the main street or the small restaurant or the diner or the clothing shop or the, you know, the small retailer. People whose relationships, dry cleaners, people whose relationships are completely built on day after day, month after month, year after year, a face-to-face -face human contact with their customer base um, just absolutely by this thing over the course of the past 10 or 11 months. Um, and of course it would also come in more than one wave just so you would get used to the fact that maybe you were over it and then it would come rip-roaring back again which is what it's done over the course of the fall. So, you know, when I think about this, what I, I really think about more often than not is just how insidious and destructive um, COVID has been in so many ways, both to people's physical health, but to their state of mind and to, to so many of the things um, that are important in a period of high anxiety and stress. So, um, I mean, we come and we visit here with you all before every major holiday for the past 10 months and ask you to tell all your listeners, viewers, or readers to tell people not to celebrate them. Don't celebrate the birthday. Don't celebrate the anniversary. Don't celebrate Christmas. Don't celebrate Hanukkah. Don't celebrate New Year's. Don't celebrate Halloween. Don't celebrate, don't celebrate. I mean, this is not what I thought I would be spending my time in. The, I know it's not what you thought you were going to be spending, or you thought we would be spending our time doing. Um, and it shoved so many other things to the side. Every once in a while, when I really want to get depressed, I go back and I read my State of the State from January of 2020. Um, so, um, I, I, Jonathan, I can't speak to sort of whether this is the worst year on record, but, but based on the 
the way I believe this virus has upended and disrupted a lot of what most people consider to be most precious here in Massachusetts and in many other places around the world, it's got to be one of the worst, certainly one of the worst ever. Governor, specifically, a lot of people are talking about it as we get into tomorrow. What, what is your biggest good riddance, besides that, maybe our question, but, um, going into next year? What, is there something specifically that you were talking about, even things you wanted to tackle um, in your administration that you haven't been able to do? Is that something, is there a specific good riddance for this year? Well, my biggest good riddance would be COVID, but it's obviously going to be with us for a while into 2021. Um, I, I think the thing that I hope um, comes out of it is that some of what I would describe as the, you know, people constantly say, you know, don't focus on the, on the dark side, you know, focus on the positives. And, and I try to do that. But this thing, it's not easy. But um, I certainly think a lot of people have discovered that they can work in ways they never thought they could work and still be productive. And for many of them, it's translated into a lot more face time with their families um, than I think they ever thought they could find. And, and for many people, that found time has been incredibly valuable. And I'm sure a lot of them don't want to lose that whenever it is we get back to something that looks more like whatever the after, you know, the after normal is. Um, I think many people would say that um, They've discovered um, new. I can't tell you how many people have told me in the last year that they've never they've never been to a state park, right? They've never been to a local park. They've never been to um, the walking trails in their communities. They they just people have discovered all sorts of recreational opportunities in their communities that they didn't know about and or had never bothered to pursue that have now become part of their regular routine. Um, there are definitely positives in this, right, um, that I hope we don't lose when, um, when we get past it. But, um, but to me, the, the, the biggest good riddance is just the incredible beatdown that, that this thing has put on so many people in so many ways who, um, you know, basically through no fault of their own ended up in a terrible place. Um, my dad has not received the vaccine. Um, he'll be part of that crew as they roll it out. Um, he's been, you know, he's been, he's a very disciplined guy and he's been very disciplined all the way through, um, all the way through 2020. And, um, and I think for, I mean, that's another great example of where, you know, COVID got this exactly right if you really wanted to screw with people, which was, um, if there's an outbreak in a long-term care facility, what do you as a family member want to do? Go there so that you can see your family member and make sure they're doing okay. The response has to be no visitation till we clean up and clear out the cluster for all the right reasons. But that's the sort of thing that I know for many people uh, who have family members who are in, you know, assisted living, rest homes, long-term care, senior housing, whatever it might be, um, has been an incredible, you know, sort of Damocles. It just hangs out there. What's going to happen with respect to uh, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, um, my grandmother, my grandfather, um, during this period before they actually get um, get the vaccine? Um, but I think the, um, I mean, I thank God that my dad is still with us. I mean, I went over 100 days without seeing him at all. Um, and I, I do consider us to be among the lucky ones with respect to that, given how hard that virus has been on seniors generally. Um, but I think, the, um, I think the biggest challenge for um, for everybody in one of those vulnerable spaces 
is the when are they going to get to me? And um, and believe me, for all of us, that's a we spend a lot of time working that one, and that's why we continue to talk to the manufacturers and to say, how's your supply chain? Is it healthy? Are the people in it able to work? Sure, vaccinate them. We want them to be able to deliver as much vaccine as quickly as possible. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.